Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I'm Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, we're going to talk about assault weapon bans, which means obviously what are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about the state of Illinois, okay? And we're going to be talking about two specific cases out of the state of Illinois. We've talked about them both before. One's Barnett v. Raul, and the other one is Beavis v. City of Naperville. Now, as we know, those two cases and a couple others are all currently on petition to the United States Supreme Court begging to be accepted for review so we can once and for all duke it out over the constitutionality of both assault weapon bans as well as high capacity magazine bans. Now, as you know, there's already been some other people coming to the party, specifically law enforcement. We talked about both the Illinois Sheriff's Association and then we talked about the National Police Association, which also weighed in with amicus briefs on a couple of these cases where they said, hey, we really need the Supreme Court to take review of this. And by the way, when you're at it, throw these bans out. This is an entirely different tune than we've seen before. We're seeing more and more law enforcement, those associated with law enforcement, weighing in on the side of lawful and responsible gun owners. It's a very positive trend, and it's going to continue today because today we're going to talk about a whole bunch of attorneys general, got to get that correct, that are weighing in on behalf of the petitioners here. So today... Let's spend a few minutes, let's go through the brief, and let's talk about when the nation's AGs start calling BS on your gun laws. You watch the news, you read the headlines, and you know it for yourself. Your community is less safe than it was just a few years ago. So you decided to purchase your first firearm. But like everything else in your life, you wanted to do this lawfully and responsibly. So you trained, and trained, and trained. You learned the laws of self-defense and all the tactics necessary to protect yourself and your family. To this day, you continue to train and you now live by the motto that it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. You are prepared for anything. Or so you thought. Who are you going to call when it all hits the fan? Who's going to defend you for defending them? Who's going to stand in your corner when you realize that proof beyond a reasonable doubt means one thing in a high school civics class and something altogether different in the real world? Introducing right to bear. Self-defense coverage that protects you so that you can protect them. With an attorney answered hotline, you will always get a confidential conversation with your state's attorney. There are no cap limits for either criminal or civil defense. All forms of self-defense are covered, so from a fist to a firearm, you are protected. And you will have some of the nation's most passionate 2A attorneys defending you. And the peace of mind that you will have knowing that right to bear is in your corner, well, that's priceless. Listen, I've been in this industry long enough to know two things with absolute certainty. Good lawyers aren't cheap and cheap lawyers aren't good. So visit my friends today at protectwithbear.com and if you use the promo code WGL, you will receive 10% off. Listen, you need to protect yourself so that you can protect them. Visit my good friends at protectwithbear.com. Okay, like I said, we're gonna talk about two cases today, both originating out of the state of Illinois, shocker, of both dealing with Illinois' horrifically unconstitutional assault weapon ban. The two cases we're gonna be talking about is Barnett v. Raul and Beavis v. City of Naperville. We're not gonna dissect what the difference is between both of them. There's mild, tiny little differences, but the fight really is all the same. Now, it appears that 26 attorneys general, as well as two other state legislatures, have weighed in in favor of Mr. Barnett as well as Mr. Beavis. So we have a large swath of either attorneys generals or including state legislatures, which are now asking the United States Supreme Court to accept review of these cases and to please, please overturn these bans. And they're asking it for multiple reasons. Now, just so we're clear, the states that are throwing their hat into the ring are Idaho, Indiana, Alabama, Alaska, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, New Hampshire, 
North Dakota, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Carolina, South Dakota, Texas, Utah, Virginia, West Virginia, Wyoming. And then they didn't get the attorney generals from either of these states, Arizona and Wisconsin, but there were briefs submitted on behalf of their state legislatures. Now, the crux of this challenge is to the Seventh Circuit's absurd upholding of Illinois' assault weapon ban under the premise that those types of weapons don't really constitute arms that are protected by the Second Amendment. So, in framing the issue, the attorneys general state, as this court's precedents illustrate, only a few questions must be answered to determine whether the Second Amendment's plain text covers the conduct at issue. These include whether the regulation implicates the people and whether it regulates keeping or bearing arms. This court has already done much of the work in explaining what those terms mean. The people presumptively includes all Americans. To keep and bear arms refers to possessing and carrying arms. And arms includes prima facie all instruments that constitute bearable arms, even those that were not in existence at the time of the founding. And that is critical, and that comes from the Heller case. And remember, it's really not that complicated because case law specifically states, in short, the term arms presumptively includes anything that a man takes into his hands or useth in wrath to cast at or strike another. And the AGs also point out, as these courts have recognized, determining whether the Second Amendment's plain text presumptively covers conduct is not complicated. Oh, but you see, it actually is complicated for the Seventh Circuit. But one of the other things the AGs point out is, is, hey, this whole absurd argument that these types of weapons are not even covered by the plain text of the Second Amendment. Yeah, even the Ninth Circuit hasn't bought off on that argument, OK, because it was tried in Duncan v. Bonta. And even the Ninth Circuit went, well, well, time out, time out. No, we're not saying that. We got other ways that we're going to screw you. Yes, but we're not going to do it that way. The Seventh Circuit's pronouncement that arms owned by millions of law-abiding Americans are not arms defies logic. And, and this really is the most ludicrous part of what the Seventh Circuit three-judge panel did. Because you got to remember, the Seventh Circuit, they denied it on Bonk panel because, hey, the three-judge panel got it right. And remember, the three-judge panel said, hey, these types of arms actually aren't arms, okay? As the AGs point out here, rather than enforce the Second Amendment and hold PICA unconstitutional, the Seventh Circuit sought to reimagine the Second Amendment. It created an atextual carve-out from the term arms for weapons that judges deem too militaristic. Then it doubled down on its mistake at step two by concluding that history supports a distinction between militaristic and non-militaristic weapons, relying on an eclectic set of firearm regulations that look nothing like Illinois' all-out ban on weapons widely used by Americans. Its decision cannot possibly be correct. Yeah, and here's the deal. Why can it not possibly be correct? Well, you see, because there's very clear language in District of Columbia v. Heller, which states, Heller explained that the Second Amendment extends prima facie to all instruments that constitute bearable arms and explains that bearable arms include all weapons possessed or carried for offensive or defensive action in a case of conflict. So post Bruin, a lot of people come up to me with the same question that they had pre Bruin, which is how on God's green earth do these courts keep finding these laws constitutional? Now, when there was the old two-part balancing test, it was really easy to explain by just putting your thumb on a scale and saying, well, this is what's happening here. Uh, Bruin was supposed to clean that up, but we've seen all of these courts in their outright uh, unwillingness, if you would, their open defiance of Bruin, to start trying to create other areas for a two-part test, which is exactly what's occurred here where we're gonna start balancing whether or not this is actually an arm as contemplated by the Second Amendment. As the AGs point out, the Seventh Circuit's analysis here bears no resemblance to the analysis prescribed by this court. The majority quoted Heller's instructions that arms include all firearms and all bearable arms, but immediately disregarded them. Instead, seizing on dicta from Heller regarding machine gun ownership, the Seventh Circuit surmised that the correct meaning of arms categorically excludes weapons that are exclusively or predominantly useful in military service or weapons that are not possessed for lawful purposes. And what that then creates is a two-part balancing test for the court to decide, well, is this 
militaristic or not too militaristic? Is it really appropriate for self-defense or not appropriate for self-defense? And hey, listen, these are people who don't even understand the Constitution, and that's what they're paid to understand. How on God's green earth do we expect them to understand firearms? As the AGs point out, the impact is to resurrect the judge-empowering approach to the Second Amendment that Bruin rejected. Courts have the institutional tools to analyze text and history, but are decidedly less well-suited to evaluate what makes weapons better adapted for military use than private use. And let us also remember that if we were to accept that logic, that somehow or another the AR-15 is so similar to the M-16 that courts can ban it. Let us remember that just about every other platform of firearm, in fact, every other platform of firearm, has had some type of military application as well, including the handgun, which means all you need is a renegade court with this out-of-control balancing test and determines then that, of course, all of these weapons are far more useful for militaristic use than civilian use and therefore can be banned. The Seventh Circuit's conclusion that militaristic weapons are not protected is wrong and illogical. And that just sums up the point that we previously made, which is, is, hey, where does that slippery slope stop? And as a matter of fact, if you really worry about giving any of these courts a balancing test and what they could do with it, consider what the AGs point out here. There's a good reason why the Second Amendment protects many so-called militaristic arms. The framers included the right as a strong moral check against the usurpation and arbitrary power of rulers that would enable the people to resist and triumph over them. Yes, that's right. The Second Amendment, shockingly, was not designed just to protect hunters. No, we have to remember when we wrote the Second Amendment, which is at the conclusion of a very long and bloody war against a tyrannical empire ruled by a king. We established a new form of government. Do you think we might have just put a kill switch in there just in case, you know, that alternate control delete? Yeah, it was written way back at the time we drafted the Constitution. And then, of course, there has to be a historical justification for the existence of this type of ban as well. And as the AGs point out, the Seventh Circuit's historical examples do not justify Illinois' total ban on common arms. And wisely then, the attorney generals also argue, the Seventh Circuit purported to discover a historical basis for the PICA only by climbing to the highest levels of abstraction. In comparing historical regulations based on why they burden the right to armed self-defense, the majority reasoned that, one, the PICA is meant to protect Illinois communities and protect public health, safety, and welfare, and two, there is an unbroken tradition of regulating weapons to advance similar purpose. Put another way, well, we have previously regulated firearms under the guise of we're trying to save lives, so there's a historical tradition for it, so we continue to be able to lawfully do it. And then ultimately, the AGs do a wonderful job, just similar to what the law enforcement agencies did in their amicus briefs as well, which is saying, hey, listen, this is a matter of imperative importance. We need to get this understood right now. We need to define this right now because we in the law enforcement community need to understand where our rights begin and where our rights end. As they put it, the states, their citizens and businesses require clarity on what conduct the Second Amendment covers. Amici need this court to intervene. Not even two years ago, the court cleaned up the confusion and waning respect for the Second Amendment that had been brewing among lower courts since Heller and McDonald. It should act now to prevent a similar problem from escalating to that degree. Kudos to all of the attorneys general and state legislatures who weighed in on it. There are two cases where you can find this memorandum, Barnett v. Raul, Beavis v. City of Naperville, we will link it up down below so that you can geek out on it for yourself. If you got any other questions about this or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights, you guys should know how to get a hold of Washington gun law by now. If you don't, that's okay. That information is down there in the description box. And then finally, let's everyone remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.